Hello, thank you for joining me again. I've wanted to speak to my next guest for a good while. It's one of the more shocking stories that has come out of uh, the fight against what I call gender ideology. Uh, other people call it fight for women's rights and other people call it uh, trans rights. But um, uh, but this is one of the stories that shows uh, in, in very stark relief uh, the problems uh, that, 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 that surround all uh, all of this stuff so uh, uh so i don't burble anymore I'll, I'll just quickly introduce introduce my guest this is helen watts um helen hello thank you very much for joining us today hello sure. thank you very much for having me i said joining us like i'm in a tv studio of course it's just me on my <laughs> own um uh, can you just shift your camera to the, a little bit to the right uh helen you're just a little bit it'd be great to get you a bit more uh, centered that's fine um, yeah that's it that's it lovely thank you um <laughs> So uh, can you just, first of all, tell us a little bit about who you are and why you're in this particular debate? So I came into this debate because uh, I was a Girl Guide leader. Uh, I was running a rainbow unit in West London, where I live. And rainbows are very tiny Girl Guides. They're aged between five and seven. Uh, but over the years, I've worked with older girls and I was a girl guide for a long time and my mum was a girl guide leader as well um when girl guiding changed their policy uh it was actually changed in 2017 uh with no sort of formal um announcement it was sort of snuck out in uh in a sort of round robin email that went to all leaders um and it wasn't made clear exactly what the changes uh entailed um but once i sort of dug a bit deeper into that I realised that uh, the changes to the policy were quite far reaching um, and meant that for the first time, a single sex organisation was admitting children on the basis of their declared, their self-declared gender identity. Uh, so being female um, wasn't a requirement so much as identifying as a girl. Uh, and the same also applied to leaders. Right. Uh, and Conversely, it, conversely, if you don't identify as a girl or a woman, then you can't be a member of Girl Guiding, or they have, they have since changed that part of the policy. Um, and that then has huge repercussions in terms of safeguarding, in terms of privacy, um, particularly, so Girl Guiding is quite famous for doing lots of camping and residential trips. I mean, even, even with rainbows, the very little ones, um, I would take them for uh, sleepovers just for just for one night, so there'd be sort of shared sleeping accommodation. Um, and yeah, and this, I think- is, this, this change from sex to gender as a, mm -hmm. as a, a policy, the, um, the, 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 this had been, well, sorry, before it was changed, the single sex uh, nature of, uh, of Girl Guides was, was in place since 1910, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So Girl Guiding has been around since 1910, and it has always been a single sex organisation. And it's been single sex, actually, in the face of quite some pressure, actually, to become mixed sex. So Scouting, which is an entirely separate organisation, actually, it's a separate legal entity, has its own policies, rules, it does its own thing. They've had some girls since the 70s in uh, Venture Scouts, which is for the, the oldest kind of teenagers. And they've been completely mixed sex since I think 2007 was mm. the last sort of unit that went went from being boys only to being mixed sex. But Girl Guiding has always been quite steadfast and said that, no, we are a single sex organisation. We think that being in an all female environment brings particular benefits um, to girls. Um, and also having a female leadership as well gives the girls the chance to see sort of women in charge and having female role models around. Um, and it, periodically there'll be something in the press, like a boy has kind of said that, you know, he wants to join guides and um, yeah, it's so unfair that he's not allowed. And Girl Guiding have always said, no, we're not doing that. We are going to say single sex. And they're entitled to. They use the single sex exemptions in the Equality Act to lawfully stay a single sex organisation. Right. So, so this was changed without any discussion with Girl Guide leaders or, or anyone involved in the Girl Guides. This was just someone sent a round robin email saying that we're doing this now. We're, we're admitting, yeah. we're admitting so, boys and men if they identify as women. Well, they don't put it like that, to be mm. fair. So, every, so periodically you'll get a, 
everyone on the mailing list will get um so leaders will volunteers will get an email to say you know this is happening put this date in your diary here's some admin that you need to be aware of um and in uh 2017 um an email was sent advising that there were some updates to the um trans uh, well to the diversity uh, and inclusion policy but it didn't really specify what those were so you'd have to go into the website and sort of look it up and so I think it sort of maybe passed some people by actually um and it was only when women started to dig a little deeper um so the the, the policy was written in a very positive upbeat sort of way like we're so diverse and inclusive so we're going to admit members on the basis of their gender identity um but you only have to think about that for a minute <laughs> before you start to realise actually that that could be quite problematic and it does start to raise some some issues. So um, that does mean then that you could admit male children or male um, adult volunteers. Um, and we've never done that before. And you know, we're not set up to um, accommodate sort of both sexes, especially in terms of things like uh, camping facilities and residential facilities. Um, so so what was what was the uh, reaction when you started to push back against this? How did you how did you do that? First of all, what did you So Well, I started off just privately emailing um, Girl Guiding Headquarters to say, you know, I've got some questions um, as, a, as a leader. You, you obviously want me to implement this policy. And I've, I've got some questions about how I how I'm expected to do this and how I can do it safely. Um, and actually, I raised I raised quite a few separate points with them. So the, there was the obvious ones around uh, safeguarding. So Girl Guiding is set up as a single sex organisation. If you become if you change the admission requirements to gender identity, then you are de facto mixed sex operations. So we we would need I felt that we would need to safeguard um, and have policies in place that reflect that mixed sex situation. Uh, but girl guiding um, were quite clear that uh, you know, a, a trans girl who joined is no is no different to any other girl. Um, so there was no there was no need for me to do anything differently, just carry on. Um, now, uh, the, the age of the kids that you were in charge of, they, they it's obviously not so much of a factor at that age, uh, but but what, what age do girl guides, do girl guides go right up to 18 or 16? Or, they or? do, yeah, so, so my ones are quite little, but you know, even kind of you know, five and my like five to seven year olds can be quite conscious of their, of their pri privacy and you know, they want to, change privately and you know i think we can't discount the, the privacy concerns just because they're very little but i think right. you're right as the older the girls get the more of that concern that becomes um so yes guiding goes right up to 18 um so there are rainbows who are five to seven and brownies are seven to ten guides are 10 to 14 and then we have rangers who are 14 to 18 so it's Oh, it's pretty much all of childhood. <laughs> yes, yes, and and uh, like uh, obviously, there's there's uh, um, there's there's concerns. There would be concerns about, um, especially adolescent boys, uh, uh, being in shared accommodation with girls and so on. But the most shocking aspect for this to me is the fact that girl guide leaders mm. can adults. An adult male can identify as a woman and become a girl guide leader. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. The um, the criteria for for becoming a, a volunteer um, and taking the promise is that you identify as a woman. So the way that girl guiding is set up, there are some men involved, but there's sort of two tiers of adult um, volunteers. So there are the full members who sort of make their girl guide. Uh, promise and they can only be women mm -hmm. it is also possible for um for, for people and including women as well who don't want to make a, a promise but they want to get involved and help in some way um and those are sort of support positions so things like treasurer or sort of a, an, an assistant kind of helper um so you still have to go through all the you know, dbs checks and everything else but you're not a full member and those positions are open to men and it's it's quite common they'll often a brown owl's husband or um, a dad or you know, we have a few men who are who are involved but the rules are very clear about that male volunteer if you have any 
males who identify as men, then they must, if they come along on residential trips, which is which is possible, we sometimes need extra adults to help with ratios. And a very common uh, thing that happens is that um, a, a, a girl guide leader, it, she doesn't have childcare for her own children, but still wants to take uh, her brownies away on brownie holiday, then she'll need to bring her own children with her and she may have boys. So if she wants to bring her children, she's able to do that. But the rules are very clear that any males must have completely separate sleeping and washing accommodation. They must have their own sort of shower block and they must sleep separately to the rest of the girls. It's it's very, very strict. However, if there is a male child or a male adult who identifies as a woman, then he or she is, uh, we won't... Uh, <laughs> Don't worry, we use reality pronouns, pronouns. pronouns. I'm going to use, use sex-based pronouns. So yeah. um, he is then entitled to use the women and girls facilities. Now, yes. again, I should also make clear because sometimes people get confused that you know adult leaders do not, what female or not, do not share things like washing facilities with girls. They they always have their their own toilets and their own um, shower block that kind of thing. But but. The adult leader is still entitled to use, or the, the 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 male who identifies as a woman who's an adult leader is still entitled to use the same shower blocks, the same loose, the same communal sleeping accommodation as the women. Yeah, leaders. because it, it was like never, me, yeah. it was never a question. It was never a question that it wouldn't be a woman doing it until exactly. three, three years ago. And the thing the thing that blows me away about this is basically what you're saying is that. Uh, girl guides uh, safeguarding principles are very robust mm, uh, very uh, until someone says well I'm a woman I mean I mean that's yeah. really like and stone um, what we what what we know as Stonewall law which is uh, which has been misrepresenting the Equality Act um, I guess is used to make oh. make girl guides believe they will be uh, They'll be being um, uh, bigoted if they if they don't accept these people at 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 their word, you know. And the thing is, there's probably lots of lots of lovely people who want to who want to do this for innocent reasons. But safeguarding has to be has to be completely robust, uh, you know. Here's another thing that sorry, I'm, I'm I'm telling you this like you don't know it, but here's another thing that shocks me about all this. Did didn't you once say that um, if a if a male who is identifying as a woman is a, a girl guide leader the parents do not have to be informed in fact do they specify that the parents shouldn't be informed of someone's trans status yes that's correct that's extraordinary that's just it extraordinary is. it's it is that i think to be fair to guiding it's very difficult for them because they have been uh sort of trained and informed by third parties like Stonewall and Gendered Intelligence, who were the two groups that helped them put together this policy. They've been told that they must never, ever disclose um, any information. And I think we do need to be mindful because if we wouldn't, um, we do need to be aware of, of confidentiality um, and privacy. I mean, we are sort of assuming here that no one can ever tell what sex somebody is just by looking at them. I think there's this terrible myth that, um, you know, no one can ever tell the sex mm. of the unless they're naked. And it's like, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's just nonsense, isn't it? And yeah. also, you know, if there, if there is a child um, who transitions while they're at guides, the people are, people are going to be aware of it. I mean, they're not going to bring it up. I mean, I wouldn't, one of the things that I was accused of is that, you know, a, a trans child wouldn't be safe in my care. Uh, yes. Which I think is really unfair, actually. I mean, I'm not going to allow sort of somebody to be victimised or bullied because of their trans status or because they dress differently or want to be called something else. Um, I just don't think it's OK to assume that all the other girls are going to be all right sharing a changing room with someone who is biologically male, who they know is biologically male. Um, and who they feel perhaps embarrassed you know, sort of changing their... Yeah, well, top, yeah. You know, I think a lot of this, I mean, there's a lot of emphasis on on safety. And, and also for that, I got a lot of criticism from girl guiding and girl guiding said repeatedly to me, well, somebody being trans doesn't mean that they're in any way sort of a safeguarding risk. But actually, it's much broader than that. You know, it's about privacy, having bodily autonomy, sort of controlling kind of who 
who sees you and when. Um, I, I don't want to change. I mean, I don't particularly like using communal f facilities anyway. And if there's an opportunity not to, then I, I would go for the more private option. But I've been on goal guiding training weekends. Um, at, uh, they've got a couple of properties. I went to Foxley's a few years ago and it's an old property. Um, and unless you've got a medical condition, you are expected to share rooms. I shared a bedroom with four other women. There was one bathroom between us. You know, it had to kind of get changed in the same space. So if I'm going to do that, I want to do that with other women around. Um, I am making no value judgment against uh, a trans woman, I, but I wouldn't feel comfortable. Um, and I think I'd feel very uncomfortable if it was sort of sprung on me without warning. Um, and so I, I understand that, you know, girl guiding is very sort of keen to protect people's privacy. But, you know, everyone has a right to privacy and we need to work out a way of balancing these sort of conflicting rights. So a trans person's right not to be outed. I accept that. But you know, what about my right or the girl's right to control over who they share a space with when they're changing? Language? Well, that's the that's the that's the everyone on the progressive liberal left wing side of this debate has agreed that your rights aren't mm -hmm. important and uh, yeah. shouldn't be taken into consideration. I mean, that's the most extraordinary thing about all this is 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 how easily uh, progressive uh, and left wing um, uh, uh, people have just thrown away women's rights as a, as a, a women's privacy and dignity and safety as a, as a concern you know yeah. like the thing the thing that people don't seem to grasp is that um especially if if, if self-id ever be becomes the law of the land uh that you can literally declare yourself to be trans and then be accepted as a as a girl guide leader you don't need uh hormones you don't need uh surgery you can just say, well, I'm a trans woman. We've seen countless examples of, of you know, clearly, clearly blokes, uh, you know, who are who are um, taking the piss, you know. And, and, and as you and I both know, uh, predators are the, are the ones who, you know, they, they are looking for any gap in safeguarding they can find. And this isn't yeah. a gap. You could, you could drive a truck tr through this gap. You know, it's, it's it is a worry. It is a worry. I I don't think it's a very high risk of it actually happening. I think the the probability of it happening is probably quite small, but the impact of that happening would be astronomical. You know, it would be a very sort of low probability, high impact event. A big mm. thing, actually, and it would rub, it would just ruin girl guiding's reputation. Um mm. And, from a base, and they may never be able to recover from that. I think nobody nobody likes to think about predators and, you know, no one wants to think that somebody might do that. But we do have to think somebody might do that so that we can set up systems in place to minimise it. But the thing is, Helen, I mean, like you said, I, I totally agree. It's probably low, uh, low possibility, high impact. But the thing about it is when you look at the, the difference in safeguarding between the the ma male volunteers who yeah. you who you mentioned and people who just identify as women it's so shocking you know i mean no i agree it's mind blowing and 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 for me it's another reason why i, I bring this up a lot but there was a famous dentons document uh, it was a legal firm and they uh, they they advised trans activists to do as much as they could in secret they said mm. uh, they had advice like tie tie uh, uh, gen things like gender ID uh, or self ID to more popular reforms, uh, which they did in Ireland. They tied it to marriage equality, so it was passed without anyone re even realizing it was on the books. And with you, uh, they just sent around an email saying, "This is happening. That's the end of it." Um, do you think it was? Do you think that's deliberate on their part, or do you think that they've been kind of bamboozled as well? uh into doing this do you know what i mean it was the leadership just kind of thinking oh we have to be nice and, and didn't really think it through i'm not sure i mean the first point you raised actually is a really interesting one this massive disconnect so we have males who identify as men have have one sort of um protocol and then males who identify as women have a completely separate protocol and there is no difference between those groups of men 
apart from how they say they identify. And I'm not saying everyone is acting in bad faith all the time, but I mean, I mean, gender identity is just, you know, it's just nonsense. It's just this sort of like complete, it's just an article of faith. It, I mean, it just means, the. I, well, we can talk about that separately, but yeah, I, I think that's really important. And something that I raised with Girl Guiding repeatedly when they were still talking to me, I was thinking, how do we reconcile this completely different treatment for for different groups of males? And their answer is, well, you know, trans women aren't male. So um, I know, I know. Um, so, so, and and to your second point about how how this happens, well, you know, girl guiding is a bit. It's a bit con small C conservative. It's like sort of the youth branch of the Women's Institute and you know the Church of England. And I think girl guiding was becoming very conscious that it had a yeah quite a conservative sort of reputation and an image it problem. To br possibly, yeah. Um, and it wanted to just broaden and become more liberal anyway. And with the appointment of Julie Bentley as CEO, she came in in 2014. She made some quite sweeping reforms. So the Girl Guiding Promise was changed to remove any reference to God, uh, which actually I really, I quite like that actually. That was, I was very supportive of that measure because it opened up Girl Guiding to atheists and people of all faiths and none. And I think that's- Yes, yeah. Um, and they tried to just generally sort of make broad and goal guidance appeal and reach out to, to different groups of people and become sort of generally more inclusive. And then it was only a matter of time, I think, until sort of Stonewall and gendered intelligence sort of got in there. So I think this was part of a, a sort of it was part of a wider package of reforms to make goal guiding more progressive, more relevant, to shake off some of its sort of stuffy, conservative uh, image. Um, and I That's think. But I think that for me, the thing that's that worries me is that there is a pattern. So like every single women's organization has been targeted. So like the WI, the women, the network of, of women's refuges, women's aid and so on. Um, if I was really cynical, I would say that, of course, Girl Guiding was going to be a target because it was one of the only single sex organizations. So it was it was a, it was a big win, I think, to have a single sex organization crossover into uh, becoming a single gender identity organization, which is what it is now. One of the things we're seeing a lot, aren't we, when you say they were a small C uh, conservative uh, organization, um, but you can say the same about the police force. And and it seems that there's, there's certain groups in, in the UK who are so uncertain of their own uh, of their own, uh, um, I don't know what you would call it, um, uh, correctness on on certain mm. issues that they're they're actually f they're actually uh, farming out their common sense to organisations like Stonewall and Gendered Intelligence and they're kind of saying you you take care of this we don't really understand it so you you do it for us and because Stonewall are so embedded in British society uh, everyone just thinks they know what they're doing but of course um, Stonewall around the time that these changes came in on their trans advisory board was was someone named uh, Amy Challoner. Um, and Amy Challoner was with Stonewall right up until uh, very recently, about a year ago, I think they, mm. they, they took took her took uh, Amy off. I won't, I won't use the uh, female pronouns for her. Uh, but um, but Amy, uh, you know, Amy's history is um, she's obviously a, a victim of, of, of abuse, and uh, uh, because her father was a was a, a, a paedophile who tortured a, a young woman in uh, the attic of the family home. Um, and the thing is, this, of course, you can't visit the the sins of of, of a parent on the child. But but Amy then went on to marry a man who writes pornographic fiction involving children and mind control. So this was someone who obviously has a, a very, very strange uh, uh, set of beliefs and interests, who was potentially advising girl guides. I think that's difficult. So we don't know exactly what Amy Chandler's involvement was in girl guiding. So Amy was on the trans advisory panel throughout the time when when Stonewall was changing its policy. And we do know um, 
So the, the Veritas report, which uh, was published, um, it was the safeguarding report into the Green Party, uh, which Amy Chandler was involved in, was very scathing. Um, about Amy's attitude to risk and safeguarding. And it was very clear. I mean, this, this person has got... So I don't want to speculate about the reasons, but they they have no idea of uh, safeguarding, of managing risk, um, and they need to go away and have proper training. Uh, and and it was also quite scathing about the leadership of the Green Party as well, who didn't manage this. They saw there was a problem and they didn't manage it properly. Um, so all of this just fits in for me anyway to a wider picture of sort of outsourcing difficult bits of policy making to a third party that actually has no expertise. So, I mean, goal guiding is fundamentally a girls and young women's association. Like, what does Stonewall know about that? <laughs> Absolutely mm. nothing. Like, it's not their area of expertise. Um, and, you know, it's not like we've only had, you know, lesbian or bisexual girls in goal guiding, like, in the past three years. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. always there's always been girls of different backgrounds, um, sexual orientations within, within the movement. And... Um, and Girl Guardian has a lot of experience of working with girls and young women. So I think to then sort of outsource their safeguarding or allow their safeguarding policy to be influenced by a party that has no expertise in this area, I find quite um, alarming. Um, and also there's just a complete lack of transparency as well. So we don't know whether Amy was involved in Girl Guardian or not. But actually, that whole trans advisory panel, some of the members are not public so no you know some of the like general's own website says that you know not everybody who is on the panel is listed on on the website so there's a degree of confidentiality there i mean i suppose on the one hand that's okay but it's maybe not okay if you're then going on and advising schools and the police and girl guiding and whoever else i mean where is the accountability there mm, mm, yeah um, and also there's there, there uh, you know there's a lot of people who suspect that challenger is still advising uh, under the guise of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, you know, anonymously. Um, but although, of yeah. course, we, we can't know for sure. We can't know for sure. Um, the other thing about Challoner I found out recently is Challoner is running the Animal Crossing Reddit group uh, on, uh, 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 on Reddit, uh, the, the LGBT uh, uh, Animal Crossing Reddit group. Now, that's going to have children on it, you know, and, and Reddit have just have just uh, closed the gender critical board, which had 64,000 yeah. women on it. Uh, probably men too, but but mostly women, I'd say. Um, and so, you know, again, you've got to you've got to ask who is pulling the levers on all this yeah. stuff. You know, why is this? Why is there? Why is discussion being closed down? Reddit also closed. Uh, sorry, Alan, this is slightly off the off the subject, but it's no, very interesting. It's very interesting. Reddit also closed down the board called something like, I don't know what it was called, gender gender trans debate. And what it was, it was a board for gender critical people and trans people to talk to each other and mm. to try and understand each other's positions. They closed that board, you know? I, it's just, I, I, yeah. I mean, what I, what I find interesting is why is there so much silence around it? Why is there so much fear of talking about it? And, you know, you have to say, there, somewhere along the line, there are a few people in 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 key places, and I don't think they're doing this for good reasons. I think they're doing it because they're opening up, um, they're opening up uh, opportunities for themselves. You know, like the the the, the more porous safeguarding is, uh, the the better it is for every predator, every person who who, who uh, because like isn't there a there's a I know that the 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 guy who killed those two girls uh can't remember where it was the ones in the football tops uh but that was called a they call that something they call that a, a a crime of opportunity i think it was something like that where he was driving along he happened to see them uh um walking along the road and uh and and it was just a an impulsive thing he just grabbed that moment the, the thing is that if you create these kind of holes in safeguarding you'll create more of those opportunities you create more of those those uh crimes of opportunity you know but but what what did you um how, how did you go about trying to change their minds on this and, and what was their response okay so i had a, a quite a long sort of to and fro of emails actually um 
and I I did ask for a meeting and was and was turned down. Um, and actually, I I raised multiple issues in those emails. So around around sort of privacy and the kind of safeguarding in a sort of communal accommodation setting. Also around which you've just touched on is um, you know if part of the policy was that if a girl discloses her trans status, then we we must keep complete confidentiality at all times and um like you i was i am concerned about things like some of the subreddits where um sort of kids are sort of logging on and sort of being adopted by sort of adults um who are trans and who are supporting them supporting them um mm -hmm. from their sort of unsupported parents i mean all of this stuff is just should be waving like massive red flags and and my my concern concern that I sent to Girl Guardian is well, if the girl discloses that she's doing this are you seriously telling me that I can't say anything at all I can't even report it to our own safeguarding team like how how do we manage that um and then I started to get quite I think I was quite angry actually I was brushed off every turn every, every time I asked a question a sensible question I got a ridiculous answer. So I was told that Girl Guiding has always been a single gender organization, not single sex. I mean, um, and that a, uh, a cis boy is not the same as a trans girl lesbian. A cis straight boy is not the same as a trans girl lesbian. Okay. okay. Um, that there was no safeguarding concerns and I didn't need to do anything. Um, and that if there was a claim, it's all right, our insurance would cover us and they would support any leaders if there was a problem. Um, wow. So I should just rewind a little bit. So um, Girl Guiding is a very decentralised organisation. So you have sort of like each village or town or borough, whatever, will have several kind of units, but they all operate fairly autonomously. Um, and it's unusual to know lots of people outside your sort of immediate um Region. So you'll know you'll know the people in your district and maybe your county, but it's quite hard to get to know everyone else. Um, and it's very there's no sort of way of communicating with everyone around the country. So, but there were, in fact, I think there still are sort of unofficial Facebook groups for leaders. And every now and again, somebody would post a story or a newspaper story um, about trans issues. And they they did when the press picked up in 2017 about the change in policy. It, somebody posted on those forums look at this story I'm not sure how I feel about this and it was immediately sort of pounced on by the same by the same people every time you know isn't girl guiding inclusive and amazing we, we won't have transphobia here and then you know, comments were turned off and the posts were deleted so it was clear wow. that I wasn't going to be able to use that route to try and like you know, speak to other leaders outside of people that I immediately knew uh, so I started, I had an old Twitter account that I hadn't used for ages, so I reactivated it and uh, started posting about it. Um, and then I uh, used Mumsnet as well. I was already sort of on the Mumsnet, yeah. famous radicalisation platform. <laughs> uh, I'd been on there for a while, actually. Um, so I started posting about it. Uh, and then it just sort of took off, actually. There was lots of lots of interest um and fair play for women as well did a lot of work with this and helping to get the word out and getting getting it into the press because back in 2017 there were some press stories about um the change in policy but they were sort of written from quite a sensationalist kind of oh, there's going to be boys in the girls yeah. it yeah. wasn't a, it wasn't a considered sort of sensible discussion around you know, what is what does this actually mean okay yes that but what about everything else i mean even something as fundamental as you know what are we teaching girls if we tell them that actually being female is is just a a feeling um and you can identify and out of it in and out of it almost at will like what what is that teaching girls um and you know, does that mean that when we talk about presenting as a girl does that mean well if you don't like wearing pink and you have short hair or you like sports that you know you yeah. play be or something then you know then you are you're not a girl like I think there are some very quite deep issues here and those sort of first newspaper reports really didn't touch on those at all so we were able to get some traction and then it didn't take long um I uh received a phone call actually from my county commissioner to say that there have been complaints about me um, and they were going to be investigated and then um so the complaints uh 
I never saw the complaints actually. I had to wait until after I was thrown out um, and then uh, did a subject access request um, to get a copy of the complaints. And even then they're very heavily redacted. I mean, I understand if the complainant wanted to remain anonymous, but I still don't know exactly what it was that was upheld about me. I mean, it, it, obviously I can guess. I mean, I have seen the redacted complaints since, um, and it, as far as I know, there were five complaints. I've got no idea whether the people that made them had any connection to girl guiding or not, or if they were sort of acting on, I don't know. It could have been anyone. Well, exactly, or <laughs> CC Green or somebody like that. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, the evidence presented was sort of posts that I'd made on on Mumsnet and Twitter. I mean, I, I did have um, a barrister sort of look over after the event sort of look out of, over my twitter feed and he was like there's nothing transphobic here you've ju you've just asking awkward questions and you disagree with them yeah so i mean the, i don't know one day i should publish <laughs> what was said about me i mean it was just outrageous i mean one of the complaints said um you know it makes you like so she, she there was kind of like I'm saying she, I've got no idea if it was a man or a woman. The the complaint was sort of a list of bullet points and half of it's blacked out, so there's not much context. But like the second bullet point is um, it, what she says on Facebook makes you wonder what she thinks about all people with penises. And it's just like, what? So Girl Guiding took this seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it was just, it, it was just, it was just the most bizarre sort of collection of sort of, it was just, people sort of whinging actually saying well you know she shouldn't be allowed to say this it's like well i can i can say it it's a free country it's interesting that they didn't redact that one because that's like that's like the most clearly men mra statement i've ever heard that's yeah. pure mra uh, language um and so and so then they took your troop away they did. I mean, so um, I've kind of skipped ahead a little bit, but so the, the complaints process started. I hmm. did to just prior to that. I did manage to get a meeting with the CEO of Girl Guiding and the chief guide, uh, but that was just sort of, I think, because of the pressure that was on them because um, there'd been newspaper stories by that point and um, it was getting a lot of coverage. Um, and they agreed that you know they would um, look into our points that they were awaiting the EHRC schools guidance. Do you remember this? This school guidance, which is now two and a half years late. Um, mm. uh, you know, they were they were looking for that um, and they would use that to sort of inform any policy updates, advise that um, they don't consult on legal issues as far as this is, as far as they were concerned, this was a legal issue and they had to update their policies to reflect current law. Um, which is not true as well. No, no, it's not true. There's very little case law in this area at all. Um, but also, they're, they're, they're presumably oh, no. quoting the Equalities Act, which mm. protects on the basis of gender re reassignment and sex. It doesn't protect on the basis of gender, which is a completely exactly. different thing. But all these people think that they're breaking the law uh, when, in fact, they're actually breaking the law when they make this change. You know, and Stonewall mm. have, have, have managed to bamboozle all these organizations into thinking they're following the law when they're not. It's extraordinary. I know. It's just bizarre. And then also Girl Guiding, because they were getting a lot of attention, were sort of issuing sort of statements and and then also providing training to other other leaders to say, well, this is the law. Um, well, yeah. But it's not the law. You can't train other people in the law as you wish it to be you are obliged to um, manage your organization as the law actually is and it is very difficult because there's not much in the way of of case law um the hrc guidance is not very clear and the updated schools guidance which they were relying on quite heavily because it's sort of the nearest sort of organization uh or the nearest type of organization i suppose um it, that never arrived so they you know i appreciate they were a bit sort of hamstrung there and we ended up sort of kind of going back and forth and me saying well this this isn't the law and you know here's you know i've got some barristers and some experts here who um agree with with me and and they said you know well we don't care um <laughs> so the complaints process started um and then that sort of dragged on throughout the summer and it was really awful so we went back uh in september so i did one week back in september with my rainbows and then i was kicked out so i had a phone call with my county commissioner and then i received a letter saying that all the complaints against me were upheld uh, they found that i breached the social media policy 
uh, and the code of conduct. So I was um, I was expelled, and and yeah. that was the end of it. And yeah, and so part of the um, expulsion means that I am banned from all girl guiding meetings and events. I can't. I'm not allowed to contact anyone. I'm not allowed to. So I mean, I did lose the the troop, and um, that must have been heartbreaking. Yeah, it becomes quite a big part of your life. And it's something that I'd always done as well. So I'd, I'd been involved in girl guiding since I was about seven. Um, and my mum was a, a brownie leader for a long time as well. So I used to, when she took her brownies away on holiday, I used to go with her um, to help and stuff, even if I wasn't there sort of week to week. Um, so, yeah, I just feel like a bit of a, a bit of a loss. And the girls are great. I mean, it's a really nice age group, actually. Yeah. Yeah, no. quite good fun um but most of the the parents are really supportive i had some very nice emails sort of wishing me well um offering sort of you know do i need legal help um several of them sort of um gay went to the press as well so andrew gilligan did quite a big piece um on the weekend when i was kicked out and he spoke to some of the parents and i had a bit of a cry when i saw some of the nice things they said um yeah, yeah. And can I ask, do you have any idea how this policy has affected girl guiding? Are they are they losing members, or uh, is it just the same as it ever was? Uh, do you know how? To, uh... Well, it's really interesting. So, girl guiding is it's not a very transparent organisation. So, there's no all member AGM. There's no uh, they don't publish huge amounts of data. So, mm. I. Actually, I should have done this and I didn't, but they do publish overall membership numbers in their annual report and accounts. And I haven't looked at. OK, that would be interesting, things. wouldn't it? So I should go and have a look, actually. Uh, mm. and see. I mean, generally speaking, as far as I'm aware, numbers are down and they, they have been going down sort of over uh, over recent years. I mean, I think part of that is because you know, some girls would rather um, go to you scouts and also i mean there's a million after school activities and different things you want mm. to do um that, that children can do um so it's quite a crowded kind of marketplace um but you do wonder i do wonder what effect this is having and i think because the atmosphere around this is so toxic um and because it's it's so hard to sort of say what you think that it's easier just to say nothing and just to sort of leave or or just sort of not not get involved and i think that that i think that is happening i think parents have decided well this isn't for us we'll go we'll go and do something else instead although having said that most kids after school um clubs and activities are affected by this so i mean scouts are still operating on gender identity i mean woodcraft folk is even more pro-trans i'd say than girl guiding mm. things like british gymnastics um i think some of the the swimming clubs you know swim england like this is not you know, it's not unique to girl guiding by any means it's just everywhere i mean children just cannot escape this mm. especially girls especially girls i think it hits girls hardest yes 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 uh, one thing that is quite interesting and it's i it's too early to sort of know what's going to happen but i'm going to be watching it very closely is uh so girl guiding have announced that they're doing a diversity and inclusion audit right. um, and it actually it you could, they were inviting members and parents and volunteers to apply to be on focus groups um and they were particularly looking for people from uh bme backgrounds from the LGBT backgrounds, people or uh, kids with um, additional needs and disabilities, and from working class backgrounds, so they're they're, they're particularly keen to hear from those groups of people, uh, and also from minority faith groups as well. So they're very keen. They've said they're very keen to hear from these people and to see how they're doing, and they want feedback on things that they're doing well and things that they're not doing so well. So I do wonder if gender will. Is that something that I can point people to? Is there a link or something that I can point people to? to well, to, it closed yeah. today. So the application's oh. closed. So I have been tweeting about it and I've been posting such. Well, I'm not on Twitter, I'm Helen. Not. So thank you for oh, rubbing sorry. it in. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Helen, I think that's, uh, I think that's um, um, all I all I have for the moment. Um, are, are you, how are you, uh, 
how are you kind of taking this fight forward? Are you are you still still kind of engaged with girl guides, or are you moving on to other aspects of gender ideology and how it's affecting us? Um, so my so my current plans have all sort of by like everyone's all sort of been put um, turned upside down by um, by COVID nineteen, and obviously there are no physical girl guide meetings at the moment, no camps, no yes. trips. So that does change things slightly. Um, but yes, I want to keep going. Um, girl guiding will not speak to me, right back to me, to anything. So I think, um, you know, it, the next steps and, and things I want to explore a bit more are pushing the Charity Commission much harder on this because they, they have a, an obligation to make sure that charities are fulfilling their objects um, and that they've got appropriate safeguarding processes in place so they have been approached before and they weren't particularly uh, responsive but it does I don't know how you feel about this but it does feel and I, I always hesitate to say this but it does feel like things have maybe shifted like in the past since three years ago I think like it's been talked about more like it's maybe less taboo there are more people maybe sort of coming for I don't know well I think I mean it's it it's always it swings in roundabouts really you know because one day something wonderful happens like jk rowling comes out in support mm. of women and the next day something terrible happens like google start trying to put pressure on the british government to remove yeah. women's rights so it's um it's it's hard to know really but i do think one thing i think that things like the gender critical um page being taken down uh and if I may be so bold, my own removal from Twitter um, show that they're they're kind of uh, um, you know it, it, things always get worse before they get better. And I think that mm. these may I'm hoping these may be the last desperate flailings before they realise no, we actually have to speak about this. We have to talk yeah. about this properly, you know. But um, but anyway, well, listen, Hel, thank you so much for for joining me. If there's anything useful I can put in the uh, links below the video, send them to me and I will. Okay. And uh, until then, um, I hope one day you get your troop back or a troop back. And uh, thank, you, thank you for all that you do. Okay, thanks very much, Graham. All righty, bye-bye, Helen. Thank you. Bye.